The Boston Celtics established an enduring legacy of greatness. It began in the 50s with Red Auerbach, Bob Cousy, and Bill Russell. It stretched into the 80s with Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, and Kevin McHale. But in between, there was one crucial link in this chain of Celtic champions. He's John Havlicek, and we'll have his story this week on Vintage NBA. Basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new Iceman. The modern day, Bill Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what greatness is all about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Robin Roberts. This week, we profile the man known as Hondo, Boston Celtic great John Havlicek. He graced the parquet floor for 16 seasons, helping the Celtics build their championship tradition. And he was a man in perpetual motion. Hondo just never stopped hustling, even when he went shopping, as you'll see a little bit later. One player who's taken John's hardworking style into the 90s is Chris Mullen, who's in the chair this week. Now, as a kid, he idolized Havlicek, but Chris couldn't bring himself to root for the Celtics, seeing that he's a Brooklyn native. You know, growing up, I was probably more of a Knicks fan. You know, was, they were a good team and had some great, great players. But my first coach told me to watch this. John Havlicek, so I did. Here come the Celtics. Clock will start when it's touched. Yeah, I remember this Phoenix game. I've been watching this crazy game. Havlicek touches it. It begins. Three seconds. Hondo off the glass. He's got it with a second. John Havlicek won it. The Boston Celtics, but the clock should have run out. Or did it have two? Right, two seconds on the floor. Floor. The other thing that's pretty... Amazing. I think these days we all think that we're running new plays and have all these new things going on, but you see all the same plays run. They all look the same. It's just different people. Here goes now John Havlicek. Motion. He's driving. He goes right up. Makes an almost possible shot as he almost hits the floor, banks it in. You know, I went in my backyard. You know, if you hit a bank shot to win the game, I was hitting that bank shot, you know, and counting the clock down in your head, five, four, three, and then until you made that shot to win it, you didn't go back in. And yeah, we all like to be seven foot and be able to dunk the ball all the time, but that's probably not going to be your future, so you try and find somebody, you know, with comparable skills anyway. Not that I have his, but, you know, somewhat. This is nice right here, huh? That makes me smile, man. That's nice. I like the green and white, you know, my Irish background and number 17. It's beautiful. Wish I could have worn one. <laughs> Not now. The other forward, six, seven from St. John's, number 17. When I, uh, went to uh, Golden State. One of my teammates was wearing 20, which I had worn in college. So it was, it was basically time to choose a new number. A lot had to do with John Havlicek. When I went to the game, I just see a guy running, active, you know, always into the game. Good play that time by Havlicek. He kept moving. He's probably the one guy nobody wanted to guard because he never stood still. He didn't know where he was. He just kept running, running, running. Scott has Havlicek ahead of him. Hondo keeping the motion, keeping the movement. Rolls in the hook shot, the game is time. Sometimes guys tell me, slow down, will you stand still for a minute? When someone says that, you know, you keep him busy and you're being a pest. You're being hard to guard. And I could just see him being like that. He's doing anything he can to influence the game for his team to get an advantage. 
143 playoff games for Hondo Havlicek. I'm trying to uh, age gracefully like he did. The fact that Hondo played 82 games when he was 38 years old just reinforces what great condition he kept himself in. And as long as he was going to play, he was going to give his all. He gets it out deep and Havlicek steals it. My greatest memory, you know, not only from watching him, is, was getting to meet him. Coming away from that, I was more impressed with him as a person, just how regular he was. Not many people live up to, you know, what you think of them, and he went beyond that. You look up there and, you know, you, you know why his jersey's hanging there. You know, a lot of, most of it is because of he's a great basketball player, but you know, he became great because of the person he is. It's kind of nice to look up there, you see that number, and you go, I know him. He's a good guy, man. He's, you know, a wonderful player, but he's, he's a great person. Chris not only wears John's number, he also has the same kind of endurance. And we even dug up an old vintage stat to prove it. Mullen led the NBA in minutes played in 1991 and 92, while Havlicek led the league in minutes played in 71 and 72. Hondo just kept going and going and going. Oh, you get the idea. But it's what he did with all those minutes that made him such a great player. And up next, we'll remember his legendary career. Havlicek was so dedicated to the game. You know, he loved the game and he loved to get out there and play. Number 17, John Havlicek, just barreled through the traffic to get a good spot for a rebound. Havlicek is a real scrambler. Hey, John! This is the uh, heir apparent uh, to Frank Ramsey's role, and of course, uh, it got to the point that he was so, so valuable that it was hard to use him as a sixth man. John See, Havlicek. John Havlicek, <laughs> I'll tell you, here's something else. John Havlicek was the NBA's version of Forrest Gump. Even as a kid, he loved to run, sprinting to and from school, and he became a great all-around athlete. In fact, John was drafted in two different sports. In 1962, the Cleveland Browns wanted him as a wide receiver, but he ended up with the Boston Celtics. Not a bad career move. Havlicek was a 13-time All-Star, won eight championship rings, and became Boston's all-time leading scorer. Along the way, he came to symbolize Celtic pride. And the Celtics, they have done it again. A spectacular finish. It's all over. The Boston Celtics are once again the world champions. Winning an astounding 11 championships in 13 years, the Boston Celtics featured some of the NBA's all-time greats. And one of them was John Havlicek. Drafted in 1962, he became one of the building blocks of the fabled Celtic dynasty. Red always drafted a person not only on his ability, but what kind of background did he have. And I know that when he drafted me, Jerry Lucas was the most publicized person from that Ohio State team. But he liked sort of the character that I had. Havlicek was so dedicated to the game. You know, he loved the game and he loved to get out there and play. Number 17, John Havlicek just barreled through the traffic to get a good spot for a rebound. Havlicek is a real scrambler. Hey, John! He came to play every night. You know, there's some players who won't just let down. Now, Havlicek wanted to win every game. Stolen by Havlicek. Havlicek, a three-on-two break to Bailey Howell. John Havlicek was his biggest star as there was in the, uh, in the NBA at that time. He epitomized what the Boston Celtics were all about. Havlicek's 29th point. Puts Boston up 107 to 103. Havlicek... Honda was one of the game's most prolific scorers and tireless workers. He also had a knack for rising to the occasion when the Celtics needed him most. I never put pressure on myself because the only thing you can do is try your best and do your best. And some people have the ability to uh, get the job done a little better than others. And I think a lot of it has to be accomplished through the uh, physical talent that you have, the mental aspect, and maybe there's divine intervention. It's pretty hard to look at consistency and call it luck. 
But I'm here to tell you that the, that the Celtics were the luckiest team ever saw. We basically thought we had the game pretty much in the bag. I scored the last 10 points. So we had let Philadelphia score an easy basket to cut it to one point. The Celtics are leading 110 to 109. There are five seconds left. We got a one-point lead, and it's our ball out of bounds. I did not trust anybody else to take it out but me. I wanted to take it out because I'd make sure that I could make a good pass. Now Russell is... He loses the ball off the support. Russell lost the ball off the support, and the ball goes to Philadelphia. We go in the huddle, and all I could say was, guys, we got to do something. <laughs> Greer putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep and Havlicek steals it. Over the stand goes. Havlicek stole the ball. Havlicek steals the ball. Havlicek stole the ball. Havlicek came to the rescue. Havlicek, how lucky can you be? Took me off the hook. Of course, there was all kinds of happiness and jubilation. And that's probably one of the biggest thrills a player can get. In a career that spanned 16 seasons, John Havlicek left his mark on two generations of Celtics. First, as the invaluable sixth man on the great teams of the 60s, and then as their main man, the veteran star who led Boston to two championships in the mid-70s. I don't think that when players come to the Celtics initially, they believe all that pride and, you know, mystique and that type of thing. But once you become a member of the team and have success, then you say, I was part of that. That's something special. During those years that uh, Havlicek was playing on championship teams, he was always focused. If this guy were able to play till he was 100 years of age, he would enjoy playing. When you retire, the thing you miss the most is the camaraderie. And it all brings together the, the fiber of people. And it brings them, in most instances, and with the Celtics into a collective positive process and that's what what i miss the most after i retire john will always be remembered for that steal in 1965 but he says it wasn't just the play itself that made him so famous it was the call by announcer johnny most that's been replayed over and over again and you know wilt has to cringe every time he hears it boston went on to win the title and that summer a record album was released. You remember albums, don't you? It featured a decade of Celtic highlights and was titled, fittingly, Havlicek Stole the Ball. Now let's take a look at what else was happening back in 1965. back to Vintage NBA. It may surprise you to know that John Havlicek had a little something in common with the rock group The Who. A small thing, really. They were both rising to stardom in the mid-60s. And in 1966, while the Celtics were winning their eighth straight title, The Who had a hit that could have been John's theme song, Substitute. He perfected the role of six man. Not that there's anything wrong with being the one who steps in for someone else. In fact, it happened quite a bit during Havlicek's career. Probably the best example is Gerald Ford. He stepped in as vice president after Spiro Agnew resigned in 1973. Then at the height of Watergate, Ford came off the bench one more time, moving into the Oval Office after President Nixon resigned. Then there's Pete Best. Name doesn't ring a bell. Well, it would have if Bess had only continued as the drummer for an up-and-coming band from Liverpool. But he was replaced by another drummer named Ringo Starr. The band, of course, was the Beatles. And the rest is history. On the tube, Jack Parr was the original host of The Tonight Show. But in 1962, Johnny Carson moved into his seat and kept it warm for about the next 30 years. How about Bewitched? Well, Dick York was the original Darren Stevens, the husband of nose-twitching Samantha. Eventually, York was replaced by Dick Sargent. But let's face it, if you've seen one Durwood, you've seen them all. And finally, there was Bond, James Bond. The original 007 was Sean Connery, 
but he passed the martini shaker on to Roger Moore, and the Bond movies didn't miss a beat. As for John Havlicek, he finally gave up his supporting role in the 70s to become the Celtics' leading man. But even after he became a superstar, John still had to do the things the rest of us do, the everyday chores like shopping, for instance. It's just that John brought a somewhat different approach. He also brought his teammates. Bradley presents the Boston Celtics Shopping Drill. Cowan takes the ball, using his head. Nelson juggles. Havlicek fakes and drops it. Here they come through hardware. Cowan to Havlicek with the over-the-counter brand name Law Pass. alley -oop to Nelson and up those wide Bradley aisles in a sporty good. A pass to Nelson. Another pass to Nelson. One more. Two passes to Nelson. And a big pass from Nelson to Havlicek and Cowan for the men's wear high fashion fast break. It's Nelson moving up to Cowan. Ball's no good. Well, okay, here's a new one. It's the Bradley's easy return policy play. They're moving like a well-oiled machine. Yes, it's a discount price scoring drive. Havlicek to Nelson, Nelson to Cowens. He shoots a basket. Is it any wonder the Celtics won all those championships? They took the concept of teamwork to a whole new level. And all those fast breaks of the aisles help keep Havlicek in shape for the NBA. When you check out his bio on NBA.com, you can tell just how well-conditioned he was. It says that by one estimate, Hondo ran from three to five miles during a typical NBA game. He ran even more than that on May 10, 1974. It was game six of the NBA Finals, and it turned into a Boston Marathon as the Bucks and Celtics battled into double overtime. We'll relive that classic game in just a moment. After their dynasty of the 60s ended, the Celtics spent the early 70s climbing back to the top of the NBA. Led by Havlicek, they returned to the finals in 1974. There they faced Oscar Robertson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the Milwaukee Bucks. Boston led three games to two and hoped to clinch the title at home, but the Bucks had other ideas, as you'll see in this week's Airwave Archive. It's May 10, 1974, and Milwaukee leads by four late in the fourth quarter as we join Pat Summerall, yes, he did basketball too, and Rick Barry at the Boston Garden. 84-80. Just over two minutes left now. Two minutes, two seconds. One second. Two minutes left. Inside it goes, and it's taken away by Boston. Oscar took it right back. Foul is against Robinson. A backcourt foul against Oscar. That'll be three opportunities to make two shots for Don Cheney. Oscar Robertson almost came up with a super big play that time. If he had gotten the ball, Kareem would have had an easy dunk shot, and that could have iced it for Milwaukee. Now, gives a chance for the Celtics to cut it to two with plenty of time to go. This game is far from over. A minute, 54 seconds left in this game. 84 to 80. Don Cheney has two more. Penalty situation now as Cheney field possibly the pressure hits the second one that cuts it to three 84 81 nine for the duck got it Cheney a backcourt foul on Cheney boy that's a tough foul right there it's just like giving it one way and giving it back the other five fouls on Cheney also a minute, 53 seconds left. Oscar will have three tries to make two. 84, 82. First one is good. I don't think he knows what pressure is. Got them both, quickly. 86, 82, 12 for the big O. Cheney brings it across. Gives to Havlicek. A minute, 45 left. White. Oscar reaches behind, did not foul, knocked it out of bounds. Jojo made the good move. Oscar committed himself, recovered quickly, knocked the ball out of bounds. Back to the Celtics again. 13 <laughs> seconds left on the 24-second clock. Bucks don't mind that because they, of course, are trying to use up time. Havlicek gets the shot, fires, and hits. Cuts it back to two. Dandridge against Havlicek. 
He gets it across. A can of defense back outside to Davis. Five seconds on the 24 second clock as Sandridge goes up. Can't get it. Silas with the rebound. 86 84. Caney. A minute five left. White to Cowan. Boston leads this series three games to two. Oscar Robertson will inbound at seven court. Mendy Rudolph and Daryl Garrison are your officials. I can't hear a thing at Boston Garden. I don't know about you. Davis gets the ball. 12 seconds left on the 24 second clock. Kareem sets the pick and takes Cheney inside. They'll try to get it back to him. Oscar has Collins on him. Three seconds left on the 24 second clock. Collins on the floor. It's tied up. A jump ball. What a play by Dave Collins. Pat, it sucks. There's a spare. Dave Collins it. knocks the ball away as he jumps out the screen. Watch him die for the ball right here. Look at this hustle. He's called a timeout. There's a situation, Pat. He dove and got the ball, jump ball. But if he had not knocked the ball away and got the jump ball, the 24-second clock was about to expire, which would have given the ball to the Boston Celtics. As it is now, both teams have an equal chance of getting the ball back. And that's the contention at the table now by Tom Heinsohn and his assistant coach, John Killaway. They're no. saying Boston should have the no. ball. 39 seconds left on the game clock. Mendy Rudolph in conference now with the Boston captain, John Havlicek. This is exactly what the argument is about. That's right. This is what the argument is about. While the ball was rolling loose, the 24-second clock expired. Nobody had possession. It should be the Boston Celtic ball under those circumstances. Mendy Rudolph is over with, with Larry Costello, and I think that's what he drew. I think that's what he's saying. Hubie Brown is alongside. We'll just have to wait and see, but I saw the reaction from Curtis Perry. I looked at the clock as Oscar was dribbling, and as Cowens knocked the ball away, there was three seconds to go on the clock, on the 24-second clock. There it is again now. Let's watch the play. Oscar is hot. Let's look again. There we go. There he's dribbling. There's, now Cowens are reaching, knocked the ball away. Now there was three seconds to go. Two. One, of course you're in slow motion, still nobody on the ball, still the clock's running. Now a jump ball in the back, you can see the clock right here. It's Boston Look. ball. The it's clock Boston is ball. off, the clock has expired. It is Boston ball. Boston will inbound from center court as the entire crowd is standing around the edge of the court. Once again though, Pat, give Dave Towns a great deal of credit. He made a super play on Oscar Robertson. Did he ever. Now, Daryl Garrison is backing Curtis Perry away, saying you've got to get him room. The bounce pass comes to Havlicek. Saved by Cheney and back to White. His jump shot is no good. Cheney got the rebound. Back to Havlicek. They reset the clock. They reset the 24 seconds. And clock. they were late doing it, Pat. They were late by two seconds doing it. When I looked over, the clock had started late. One clock read one thing, Pat. The other clock read the other. They're moving it down to 13. I know. 15 seconds. 15 seconds on the 24 second clock. And this is when it's great to have that alternate official at court side. The game clock on the left side of your screen, the 24 second clock on the other side. And now they both started. Joe Joe White throws to Cowan. He almost lost it. His hook shot is no good. The rebound to Davis. With eight seconds left, the Bucks call a timeout. We should give Mindy Rudolph and Daryl Garrison, the game officials, a lot of credit. And also the alternate, John Murphy, who was right in the thick of things and did one heck of a job. Eight seconds left in the game. Tie game with 86. He stepped on the line. 
Boy, Don Chaney almost made a super big play there. But he went out of bounds, came back in when he got the ball. Mindy Rudolph right on top of it. Bucks used up two seconds. Abdul Jabbar way outside. Robertson saves it. John McLaughlin, no good. Overtime. Now, before we go to overtime, a little perspective. That headfirst dive by Dave Cowens became one of the NBA's most memorable plays. As for Milwaukee, this series was their last hurrah. The Big O retired after the season. The next year, the Bucks finished last and traded Kareem to the Lakers. And you may have noticed that Bucks assistant coach, a future TV analyst named Hubie Brown. How could you miss him in that plaid jacket? But let's be fair to Hubie. It was 1974, after all. And if you were around back then, here's a little something to test your memory. Fifty-eight left in the overtime period. Nobody scored yet. Robertson inside to Kareem. Back to Oscar. Off the foot of JoJo White. Milwaukee ball again. They have 18 seconds left on the 24-second clock, and we have 3:52 left in the overtime. Bucks are not getting a lot of movement right now. They seem sluggish. Oscar looking. Cross-court pass high to Perry. He recovers and shoots. Finally controlled for Boston. And the roar goes up as the Celtics bring it into the front court. 18 seconds on the 24-second clock. Havlicek wheels against Dandridge. His shot is no good. Cheney out of the corner. Hit! That was Paul Silas who knocked that ball loose and kept it alive. First time Boston has led since they led early in the first period. Kareem wheels. Allen stopped him. That's five fouls on Dave right, Cowan. First team foul. Number in the overtime period, they have three. Cowan's goes right back to work. Boston by two, 88-86. Oscar, no good. Cowan high for the rebound. Boston off and running with JoJo White moving. To Havlicek. He lost it to Davis. It's Milwaukee ball. Foul's been called on John Havlicek. Loose ball foul. That is the first foul on Havlicek. I got to figure John's been fouling somebody else sometimes. I to figure that's right. Perry gets it up against White and jumps. Cowan knocks it up in the air. White controls. Two-man offense. Here's White. Chaney in the corner. He's picked up by Dandridge. Back to White. 241 left. 240. Ten seconds on the 24-second clock. Inside Silas. He wheels. Against Perry. And no! It won't go. In and out. Silas thought he had it. So did I. So did the crowd. 88-86. 220. Three left in the game. Inside from Oscar to Kareem. Back outside to Oscar. He backs against Cheney. He's got his spot. He's got his shot. And he hits. 88 apiece. 205 left. In the overtime period. It's only been four points scored in this overtime period. You'd say they're playing a little cautious. Silas comes to help White. Seven seconds left on the 24-second clock. A long jumper by White. Chaney had it. Yeah, let's see. Milwaukee ball. Off of Chaney, and that was a very, very difficult shot by JoJo White. Tough shot to be taking under these circumstances. Milwaukee's going to use one of their timeouts. We've only got a minute and 46 seconds left in this extra period Boston has two team fouls the Bucks have committed none a little pressure uh, on the part of the Celtics with two important men in foul trouble Cheney and Cowens 
Here's Perry being bothered by Silas Dandridge. Now played by Havlicek. Oscar gets it inside. That's where they want it. Skyhook goes. Tapped up by Silas, saved by Perry, and put in by Curtis Perry. Jay, a great shot by Curtis Perry. The Bucks had the ball back on the offensive boards thanks to a Celtic. A Celtic tipped the ball and kept it free. There's Paul Silas who tapped it back up. He's doing a great job now. 117 left in the overtime. Collins has the open shot. No good. Perry got the rebound. Curtis Perry working hard. So is Oscar, and Perry's going to get it across court in the pass from Robertson. One minute left in the overtime period. One minute. Dandridge started to go and held up. Nine seconds, eight seconds on the 24-second clock. 52 seconds left in the game. Marine fires. Rebound to Kenny. Almost taken away by Oscar. Silas goes. It's back to Cheney. 40 seconds left in the game. What's the problem now? Once again, Don Murphy pointing out the 24-second clock was erroneous. All right. It showed 20 seconds before. Now it's been moved back to 17. Problems with the 24-second clock. It shows 17 at both ends of the court now. 40 seconds in the overtime. Let's see. It was 20 seconds when the clock, when the whistle was blown. It was 20 seconds. Don Murphy right on top of the time situation. Well, here we go. Down to 12 seconds left on the 24 second clock. Boston tablet check. Callum Cashin. Jump ball. Boy. Jump ball. That's some call right there. I want to see that one again myself, Pat. There's the shot. Now let's watch Dave Cowens. Kareem's got inside position. He gives him a little shove. He goes up, hand on the ball. He's all over Kareem's back when he came down. Now whether or not they ruled the jump ball before he hit him, that would have to be the situation because after he came down, he landed right on Kareem's shoulders and arms. No question, though, before that, that he did have both hands on the ball. Right. Milwaukee control. And there's 23 seconds now left. Robinson being pressed by Havlicek. The double team. They throw it up. Cross court pass to Daniels. Taken away by Kenny. Goes to Havlicek. 10 seconds. 8 seconds. Havlicek's jump shot. No good. His own rebound is good. Unbelievable. 5 seconds left. 3, 2, 1. That's it. Another overtime. Another overtime. Well, Hundo was our go-to guy. Uh, when we needed a big hoop, uh, we gave him the ball and let him go one-on-one. -on -one. He had a tremendous game that game, and he was the catalyst of our ball club. Uh, we expected him to perform well each night, and he gave us, us his all every night. You know, John Havlicek uh, has always been a great, great player, and is a clutch player. You know, just finding a guy that's willing to take the last shot uh, is an accomplishment, and Havlicek always was willing to do that. Control. Boston is slow. White started to go with the shot, didn't. Dandridge got involved. That basket counts. John Havlicek coming from the weak side, got freed by the pick, beat Bob Dandridge across, got the ball, and drew the foul. Dandridge is still talking to Mindy, and he's got to be careful. Havlicek with a chance to convert here on a three-point play. That is five fouls on Dandridge. It's 92 all. I wish we had a different angle to look at that one because it didn't look like he touched him. Boston leads again. 93-92. Davis with the ball. Against White. He's going to get it across. Boston by one. 93-92. And Davis would like to get it inside or somebody would. They do. Cowan stands and watches Kareem put another one in. He is 32 points. He's been spectacular. And sure. Milwaukee goes in front. There's got to be some tired bodies out there in this on that floor tonight. Havlicek hits again. 32 for Havlicek. 
Havlicek. 32 points for Havlicek. He's playing another super game, another big clutch shot. The Bucks working into Oscar Robertson, and he's got JoJo Hoyt, and he hits. Oscar is superb. 16 for the big O. 225 left in double overtime. You just can't ask for a better basketball game than this. Tyler, who hasn't played well. Here goes Havlicek, blocked by Kareem. He stepped on the line. Kareem made great play that time. When he came down, his foot was on the line. Celtics get another opportunity. Nothing more you can ask of that man. Havlicek will throw it in bounds to White. His jump shot is good. Boston by one. 205 left in double overtime. Davis is headed for a trap, but the Bucks get it up. The lead has changed hands 11 times. Perry looking for somebody. He almost walked. Seven seconds, six now. Five on the 24 second clock. Back to Oscar. He's got to put it up. He does. And he got it. Oh, what a shot by Oscar Robinson. He had nothing to do but throw it up. Dandridge almost stole it from Havlicek, but he gets another basket. 99-98, Boston. A minute and a half left. And double overtime. Inside it goes Kareem. Collins behind him. That's it for Dave Collins. Dave Collins is out of the game. Collins is out. Collins is out. comes in. Standing ovation for Cowan. There's the play again. Oscar cuts off. Watch him lean in here. A little, little contact right there. There he is with the arm. Pressure packed situation. Nicky Davis gets it inbounds to Danville. And Bobby gets back to Davis. 17 seconds left on the 24 second clock. Saved by Oscar Robertson, but the Bucks throw it away. No, the ball was Touched tipped by Boston. Yes, Touched by Boston. Touched by Boston. Jojo White is just smiling and saying, you caught me. Yeah, he knows he hit the ball. Bucks almost threw it away again. Almost really hurt themselves. 11 seconds to go on that 24-second clock. Mandy Rudolph is saying, don't look at me like that. 11 seconds left on that 24 second clock. Now less than 10. Davis played by JoJo White. Boston by one. Coming down to a minute and five. Back behind the pass. No shot. No shot. No shot. They let it run out. Pat, I cannot understand why they did not just throw the ball right down into Kareem who had Hank Finkel playing behind him. They just wasted a lot of time. Did absolutely nothing with the ball. Have nobody to blame but themselves for turning it over. Boston now with a chance to increase their one-point lead. Finkel. Havlicek tries to get back to Henry. But now he waits for the pick. And he doesn't get it. Great defense by Oscar. John Havlicek dribbled it off of his foot. The Bucks control. Now 44 seconds left in the game. Wait a minute. Bring him back, says Mimby. He's got things in command. Oscar wants somebody else to throw it in so he can get involved in getting the, draw, the ball across court. He was the closest man to the ball when it went out of bounds. He must take it in. He throws in to Dandridge. Dandridge played by Havlicek. He's trying to get it across. They almost threw it away. Oscar does get it across, but just there. 99-98 Boston. 31 seconds. 30 now left on the game clock. Less than 30. Dandridge throws inside to Davis. His jump shot. Is good. What a shot by Mickey Davis. All kinds of pressure. He had nothing but net. 20 seconds now left in the game. Forget the 24 second clock. 16 seconds. I don't Tom, think we'll have any more overtime. Tom Heinsohn wants a timeout. Nobody's calling it. Havlicek's shot is good. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Seven seconds left in the game. The Boston captain is the game's high scorer with 36 points, 101 to 100. What a basketball game we've had. Oscar Robertson throws to Kareem. Seven seconds. Finkel, the style. Oh! Kareem with a big pressure shot. 
nothing but net again. I can't believe the way these players are performing out here, Pat. Just absolutely fantastic. The Celtics will still have the last shot of the basketball game. Here's the pass into Kareem. He looks to get it to Davis. He's not open. Takes it himself. Cheney moves over, almost gets to the ball. Kareem picks it up. There we go. Three seconds left in this second overtime period. JoJo White will throw it in this time. Goes to Westfall, to White. His long jump shot is no good. Milwaukee wins it. Milwaukee wins it in double overtime. Double overtime. Milwaukee wins it 102 to 101. After that dramatic win, the Bucks seemed to have all the momentum. But the Celtics came back to win Game 7 and the title in Milwaukee. And John Havlicek was named MVP of the Finals. Two years later, Boston beat Phoenix to win another championship. In that series, they won maybe the greatest game ever, a triple overtime thriller. And it was Havlicek who forced the third overtime with a miraculous shot. Honda was always on the court for the finish, but he wasn't always a starter. And we'll look at his legacy as the quintessential sixth man in just a moment. From the playgrounds to the pros, just about every player wants to be in the starting lineup. But John Havlicek was one of the first to prove you didn't have to be a starter to succeed in the NBA. He excelled in the role of six man. And by 1983, the player off the bench was so valuable, the NBA came up with a new award to recognize the role, the six man of the year. The concept was pioneered by the Celtics, who had the original six man, Frank Ramsey. He helped Boston win seven titles and was elected to the Hall of Fame. By the early 80s, Kevin McHale was coming off the Celtic bench. Kevin didn't mind missing the player introductions. It gave him a chance to finish his pizza and soda, always a very nutritious pregame meal. The Sixers' Bobby Jones won the first Six Man of the Year award in 1983. And his all-around play made him the first reserve to be named an All-Star. There was Vinny Johnson, who got hot in such a hurry, he was nicknamed the Microwave. His instant offense helped Detroit win two championships. Detlef Schrempp won the Sixth Man Award two consecutive years when he played for the Indiana Pacers. Known for his all-around skills, Detlef could play just about any position. But the supreme Sixth Man was John Havlicek. And once John entered the game, he hit the ground running. Hondo simply wore out opponents with his non-stop movement. Today, there are some players who've picked up where he left off. And who better to ask about it than Havlicek's first coach, the legendary Red Auerbach. Well, I think the guy that imitates him as much as anybody is Reggie Miller. It's perpetual motion. One thing that people really take for granted with Reggie, he, uh, you know, he really moves without the ball well. And, uh, you know, a lot of people see him just catch and shoot, but uh, he has to do a lot of work before he gets the ball. Unbelievable! Reggie hits the three with seven tenths of a second to go! To me, the best slasher in this league is Eddie Jones. You know, playing without the ball, um, cutting, running the lanes, and back picks. That would have to be Jeff Hornacek. Uh, the kind of mirror images. John Havichek, though, was more of a guy who would just kind of who played track meets with his defenders. And Hornacek is kind of the same way. He's just constantly moving without the basketball, very smart, very quick with his release. Go to the hoop, flip it up with a glass, picks it. Oh, what a baby. shot there by Jeff Hornacek. Probably wouldn't believe it, but I think Allen Iverson, he just always seems to be going, you know, 100 miles per hour and, and never get tired. So, um, you know, he's a guy that I've guarded, you know, a few times, and you're always chasing him around everywhere. Those are just a few of the comparisons to John Havlicek. You may have some of your own or some thoughts on Hondo himself. So just drop us an email at NBA.com where you can surf throughout the NBA history section. It includes a chat with Havlicek where, among other things, he talks about what happened to that ball he stole. We'll be right back.
After 16 seasons in Boston, John Havlicek retired in 1978. His only regret is that he couldn't have lasted two more years to play with a rookie named Larry Bird. At halftime of his final game, the Celtics retired Hondo's jersey and raised it to the rafters. He will be remembered for his all-around greatness, clutch play, and constant motion. Havlicek just kept on moving and didn't stop until he made it to the Hall of Fame. Thanks for joining us, everyone, here on Vintage NBA. I'm Robin Roberts, and we'll look for you again next week. Till then, take care. After 16 years of being John's coach, general manager, what can I say about John Havlicek? John, if I had a son, if he was like John, I'd be the happiest man in the world. For me, there's only 24 minutes left. And it's going to be a journey that will end. What more can I say? Thank you, Boston. I love you.